just to bring to something that's of worth but that will bless your heart and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself it's not what you have required you search much deeper within but through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus. The King of endless worth that no one could express and how much you deserve. So though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within But through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Sing that first verse again. When the music fades, and all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart And I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within But through the way things appear You're looking into my heart and I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Consuming fire, fan into flame. A passion for your name Spirit of God Fall in this place Lord have your way Lord have your way With us Sing that one more time Consuming fire Fan into flame a passion for your name, 
Spirit of God, fall in this place. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with us. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh, God is love, and God is 
So um, today, I'm going to be teaching Sunday school, and we're going to be talking about worship. Um, so first of all, to start off, who, uh, what is worship? All right. Anybody else? Like a definition of worship. All right, that was good. Um, all right, um, in... Um, from the from Noah Webster's dictionary, um, the definition of worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission as a lover. And um, a little background: Noah Webster's dictionary. It was originally written for um, uh, Merriam Webster's dictionary comes from Noah Webster's dictionary, and Noah Webster's dictionary comes. He wrote it um, so that people could better understand the King James Bible. So he originally wrote it so that the words that people didn't understand in the Bible, that they could be better um, understood. So that's, that's the definition of worship in Noah Webster's Dictionary. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission as a lover. Um, Rick Warren, in his book, A Purpose Driven Life, he says, Worship is the process of surrendering your entire life into God's hands. Everything you do, can, and should be an act of worship. So um, what are some ways that we can express worship to God? Um, first one everybody thinks of is worshiping Him through song. So what are some other ways you can express worship? Good. Anybody else? Huh? Yeah, that's what I have to say. Good job. Um, anybody else? Cleaning. All right, honoring parents, I guess. All right. Yep. All right. So I got um, on a website. I found ten ways you can worship the Lord, other than in song, because everybody first first thing you think of when you hear worship, you think of music. Um, you can worship Him through prayer, a regular habit of reading the Bible, um, 
obeying God, tithe, build deep relationships with other Christians, share your faith, serve others, build into your life the attitude of thankfulness, and begin turning to God areas of your life that you have never committed to Him. And um, these are all ways that we can worship God through our day-to-day life, through our week, while we're not at church, while we're not having the music and everything. And um, we all struggle with these things. None of us have all these things down pat because none of us are perfect. But these are ways that we can worship God other than worship, other than uh, music, I mean. So um, what I have here on the board is a chart that this beautiful young lady drew. Um, And it's flawed worship versus true worship. Flawed worship being where most churches, I wouldn't say most, where worship has come to today in some places um, versus what worship should be. Emotion drawn from the leader or from the band versus emotion drawn from God. Um, People focus versus God focus. Focus on the style of music versus focus on the words of the music. What's happening on the stage versus what's happening in our hearts. Who's standing beside you versus who's standing above you. Sing to sound good versus sing as a prayer or an offering. A part of a church service versus part of daily life. A feeling we can get versus appreciation we can give. Convincing God to bless us versus acknowledging God the blessings he's already given us. A focus on the cool lights and good sound versus focus on the light and hearing what he has for us. Entertainment, what you can get from it versus worship, what you can give to him. And um, this is what it's come to in a lot of places where it's all about these things on the left. And if you notice, there's a running pattern on the left side where it's all about ourself. All of these on this side are all about ourselves. Focus on the lights, focus on the people, style of music is all what we want, what we like, when that's not what it's about at all. Worship is not about us, it's about the Lord. It's completely about Him. Worship is ultimately the connection between us and the Lord. It's just that one connection between us and Him, and it's nothing else. Um, and it seems like today, a lot of people, they get connected with God um, through worship and song on Wednesday or Sunday, whatever it is. Then they go through their week, they lose that connection through whatever they're doing. And then they come back on Wednesday and expect the praise band or they expect something to get that emotion stirred up into them to, to reconnect them with Jesus. But um, I wonder how much different it would be if we fought through the whole week to maintain that connection with the Lord, to to worship Him in these ways, in the ten ways that I gave you, um, without even through song, but just to worship Him through your week and fight to maintain that connection, and then come into church and when the praise man plays, you just it just continues. It's just an outflow of your heart. I just wonder how much different our worship would be, including myself up here. It's all of us. Um, we all struggle with this. We all um, pretty much do the same thing. Um, in the Bible. There's three different kinds of wrong worship that it, that it gives us. Um, there's vain worship. We'll bring up Matthew 15, 7 through 9. It says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about, uh, of, of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. And it's, um, the main focus of that is what Isaiah said. Um, these people were drawn near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Um, a lot of times Robert um, has said, like he said Wednesday, the, the time that we lie the most is while we're singing, while we're worshiping on Wednesdays and on Sundays. Because we sing these songs, I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned, and then we go on through our week and we don't stand for a thing. We don't stand up in our by ourselves. We don't stand up with our friends. All we stand up for is we just go along with the crowd and stand up for what they're doing. And that's not what it should be. We're straight up lying when we come to church. We're lying to the Lord. Um, Another one is ignorant worship. Acts 17, 22 through 23. So Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, 
this I proclaim to you. And um, so they're, they're worshiping these gods, and they don't even know what they're worshiping. So it's ignorant worship. And a lot of times we do the same thing. We worship these gods, and we don't even know what we're worshiping. We worship gods like sports. We worship money, um, girlfriend, Facebook, boyfriend, Twitter, Internet, celebrities. We worship all these things. Anything that we put ahead of God in our week, anything we do that takes place of us doing anything that glorifies God, is something that we worship. Uh, Luke 4, 8 says, Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Um, but, but we worship so many other things. Do you worship these things? Do you worship Facebook, money, girlfriend? Do you put these things above God or do you worship God above all else during your week? Um, are these things your gods? And the ultimate question is, who is your God? Um, a scripture I always uh, I use a lot for um, when we sing "How Great Is Our God" in those songs is um, Psalm one forty seven one through four. And I don't think I put it in, but praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song is fitting. A song of praise is fitting. The Lord, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And this is the part that I always mention. He determines the number of stars, and he gives to all of them their names. Um, I think that's a God that's a little bit greater than Facebook, and a little bit greater than the paper money that's in our wallet, or the coins that's in our pocket, um, or our girlfriend. I think that God's a little bit greater that you know all those stars that are out there. Have you ever been in out in the country, in the mountains or something, and you go out, maybe you're on a four-wheeler or something, all the lights are out. There's no city lights around you. You just look up and all those stars. Has anybody done that? It's amazing. There are a ton of stars. And just to think about that God knows how many stars there are out there. And he knows each of them by name. And he knows each person on the earth by name. That just blows my mind. We can't wrap our minds about, around how great God is. He is such an awesome God. He's so worthy of our worship. And it makes absolutely no sense why we put these other things in front of him, but we do so many times. And, I mean, it's just sad to think that we put those things in front of this awesome God. And the third uh, way that worship is, um, bad worship is mentioned in the Bible, is self-imposed worship. Um, Colossians 2, 20 through 23. Um, you have died with Christ to elementary principles of the world. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, uh, which refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance, to, in accordance with the commands and teachings of men. Um, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self abusement and, yeah, and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Um, all right, if you didn't get that because of my lack of reading skills, um, what it's saying, I think this is talking about how the Pharisees... Um, it refers like when the Pharisees, like Steve's been talking about, when the Pharisees were all about their rules, about their man-made rules, where it says do not touch, um, do not handle, do not taste. It's all about the rules. They're strictly following the rules instead of doing what's right. I uh, think Steve mentioned, or it might have been Robert, I don't remember, but he said if there was a starving man, well, I think it was Steve, if there was a starving man walking by in the, in the law, actually it's in the Bible, if there's a law to uh to, um, for the for the king to eat on that day, um, it would be right for the king to give that starving man his food um, because what's more important, life or the king getting his food for the day when he has all the food in the world? And that's the thing. Like the Pharisees were so focused on human rules that they didn't really worry about. They were they were so focused on the human rules that they almost push to the side the, the laws that God's given us, the commandments. Um, and we do that sometimes also. 
And we also have, um, instead of self-imposed, self-centered worship, which is a lot of what this is up here on the left side. Um, we're so focused on ourselves that we don't even notice what God has for us. We don't even notice what true worship is. And um, I referred to this story um, about the heart of worship on Wednesday when, when we sang this song. So I printed it out, and I'm going to read it. This is the story of Matt Redman when his church, um, when they cut out worship for a little while. This is the whole story behind it. A few years back in our church, and, and Matt Redman wrote this. A few years back in our church, we realized some of the things we thought were helping us in our worship were actually hindering us. They were throwing us off the scent of what it means to really worship. We had always set aside lots of times for our meet- in our meetings for worshiping God through music, but it began to dawn on us that we lost something. The fire that used to characterize our worship has somehow grown cold. In some ways, everything looked great. We had some wonderful musicians and a good quality sound system. There were lots of new songs coming through, too. But somehow we'd started to rely on these things a little too much, and they become distractions. Where once people would enter in no matter what, we'd now wait to see what the band was like first, Um, how good the sound was, or whether we were into the songs chosen. Mike, the pastor, decided on a pretty drastic course of action. We stripped everything away for a season just to see where our hearts were. So the very next Sunday when we turned up at church, there was no sound system to be seen, and no band led us. The, The new approach was simple. We weren't going to lean so hard on those outward things anymore. Mike would say when you come through the doors of of the church on Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? What are you going to sacrifice today? If I'm honest, at first I was pretty offended by the whole thing. The worship was my job, but but as God softened my heart, I started to see his wisdom all over these actions. At first the meetings were a bit awkward. There were long periods of silence and there was too much singing, and and there wasn't too much singing going on. But we soon began to learn how how to bring heart offerings to God without any external trappings we'd grown used to. Stripping everything away, we slowly started to rediscover the heart of worship. After a while, the worship began as the worship band and sound system reappeared, but now it was different. The songs of our heart had caught up to the songs on our lips. Out of this out of this season I reflect on where we had come to as a church and wrote this song. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself. It's not what you've required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart. In the chorus, I tried to sum up where we were at with worship. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And if you don't know who Matt Redman is, he's written a number of very well-known songs. Um, The Heart of Worship, You Never Let Go, Better Is One Day, Blessed Be Your Name. Um, The recent ones, Never Once, they're playing this on the radio now, and 10,000 Reasons. And just tons more. He's probably, I would say, one of the best worship leaders that has ever lived. Um, Just a great guy. He's up there. Um, Him and Chris Tomlin are just awesome. But um, but this is a church that had this amazing worship leader, awesome singer, awesome guitar player, awesome band, great sound system. They had it all going for them. I'm sure it was a big church, and their focus was getting off because all they were focused on was what the music was, how good it was, what the songs were, how it was ministering to them rather than what they can do for God. And so many churches do that today. It's like this last one right here. Entertainment, what you can get, versus worship, what you can give. People focus on what they can get and what the music sounds like, what emotion you can get from it, and all these things, whether the the music drowns you out or not so that you can sing louder. They focus on these things rather than just pouring out their hearts and giving all they have to the Lord. Um... Uh, actually my dad said true worship brings us to a place of humility and that's so true because true worship is not about us 
You know what humility is? It's the opposite of selfishness. And um, worship is not about us at all. So many times we go into church. We, go, we even go to Gotel camp. And we go in expecting for, we expect Gotel camp to just give us this spiritual awakening and just come in us. And all of a sudden we have this new passion and we come back to church and we sing the songs and we have our hands up. But the week before Gotel, we just kind of stood there and stared at the screen, didn't even sing. What, this goes back to what I said before. What if we fought through the whole week? What if we came into church expecting to worship, to give it all to him instead of taking it all from the music? Um, this is what the Matthew verse referred to earlier. Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord says, um, these people come near, oh, it's okay. Because these people draw near to me with the, near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. I don't know what rote is. I'm going to read this version. It's easier. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. So many times that's what we do. We come in here and we sing these songs. Again, what Robert said, we lie. We lie when we sing these songs because we sing them, we lift our hands because they're awesome songs, and we're lying. We draw, near, we draw near to the Lord with our lips, but our hearts are so far from Him. We're not even focused on what, our, what we're saying. We're not even thinking about what the words are. We're just singing it because we know the song and because everybody else has their hand up. Hebrews uh, 12, 29... 28 through 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I'm going to read that again. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. When you think of a consuming fire, what do you think of? Most people. I know when I think of it, I think of the song. <laughs> but Because um, there's a few songs that are talking about consuming fire. But a consuming fire, just think of a house fire that started real small, and it just starts consuming everything in the room. Let me restart this. All right, picture a fire in the middle of a room. And gas, what did you say? And gas poured all around the rest of the room. And then that fire just moves a little bit and touches that gas and just lights the whole room on fire. I haven't seen it. <laughs> but, um, all right, well, if, you, if you've seen that movie, then think of Indiana Jones. But um, just think of, God as a consuming fire, not a bad fire that's going to burn down your house or burn down the woods or whatever, but a consuming fire that's, just think of the song that we just sang, consuming fire, fan into flame so that we can have a passion for your name. Spirit of God, fall in this place, Lord have your way, Lord have your way with us. Um, we sing that song, but when are we going to let the Lord have his way with us. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with us. When are we going to give our all to him? If you would go ahead and play that uh, song. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory? When I'm home where my soul belongs? Was I loved, but no one else would show up? Was I Jesus to the least of us? 
Was my worship more than just a song? like that? Do we want to live recklessly abandoned? When you think recklessly, what do you think of? When I think recklessly, I think of a car automatically. Recklessly abandoned. Never holding back at all. Kind of the word that we skip over just because it's part of the song. I want to live like that. I don't want to just come to church like that. I don't want to come to Wednesday night like that. I don't want to go to Bible study. Like, I want to live like that. Are we living like that? Are we surrounding our lives, recklessly abandoning, not holding back to what God has for us? Are we truly living the life that God wants for us? Are we worshiping the Lord through our week? A lot of times I think the answer is no um, for all of us because we go through and we, we lift our hands and we, we praise the Lord at church and we go out into school and we have the same temptations that we had before and we fall into the same things and we do the same things that we were doing last week and every time it's like we come to church, get that spiritual boost and then we go back to school and it's, bam, there it is, back to, back to normal. When are we going to live like that, make that our lifestyle, to worship the Lord in everything we do? Recklessly abandoned, 
never holding back. Just surrender it all to the Lord. And stop worrying about what other people think about you. Stop worrying about what your friends are going to say about you because you've lived this way the whole time through high school. You've lived this way since you've grown up. It's time to make a change. Like I said, changing the world in that bridge. It starts with us. It starts with one action. It starts with one person, and it spreads to another person. I know you've heard this example before. What if one person shared the gospel to another person or shared the gospel to two people? Those two people share the gospel to two people. Those four people share the gospel to two people. Those, I'm going to start losing track in a second. But it would spread like a consuming fire. God is our consuming fire. And if we let him work through us, it's, I can't even imagine what it would be like. If we came to church, if we lived our week at school and everything, like we were at Gotel Camp, like we were at Centerfuge. If we came to church acting like it was, what's his name? Um, uh, Ryan, Ryan Wingo Band. It's the <laughs> but it's not about the band. I'm not saying that. But pretending that, and that's the thing. We come to these camps. We go to camps, and like I said, we get this spiritual boost, and we go, and we have this passion that we want to just worship the Lord, and we have this awesome band and the nice music and everything, and all of a sudden it's just we come back, and it's like we go up and we come back down. And that's not how it should be. It should be that we're up the whole summer, maybe have some dips every now and then, but we fight to stay up, and then we get to camp, and we learn some more so we get a little higher, and then we stay up there until whatever, and we fight to keep that passion through the week, and we fight to worship him. I just wonder what it would be like. So um, I think I ran I'm a little short. Yeah, we got him. But um, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we'll uh, go to service. So let's pray. Um, God, I just thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to be able to present this message. Um, I pray to you just let these words just sink into all of our hearts. I know we all struggle with a lot of these things, and we all um, focus on the wrong things while we're worshiping. We all focus on the wrong things during the week. I pray that we would just be able to worship you in everything we do, worship you with our friends, worship you while we're in the grocery store. God, just be able to worship you in every single thing we do. I pray that you just be with us and give us opportunities to take a stand for you and to start these actions. God, just give us opportunities and give us the strength to just be able to stand up just be able to honor you and see what you have for us. God, I pray that you'd be with us. Help, Just help Steve on this Easter. Help him to um, just present the message that you've given him. I pray that you just speak through him and speak through all of us. God, I love you.